before I even get into what I want to talk about this morning, I want to reference back to John Pendray's teaching from last week. How many people were here to hear John Pendray's teaching? What was it called? Can anybody remember? Devoted or distracted. Yeah, good. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, I highly recommend you listening to it. I was pretty provoked by it. Particularly, you know, he was talking about how not to be distracted, uh, how to outwork our devotion to God. And uh, he was talking about the distraction, in particular, that his cell phone had been to him. I know for myself, I like, if only that was the only thing that distracted me. I feel like I get distracted by pretty much everything particularly when it comes to prayer. But I was particularly struck when he referenced the scripture where Jesus speaks is recorded in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, and says, Jesus instructs us to go into your room and shut the door and pray. And um, he was talking about it being a small, a small room, really that Jesus was probably referring to the inner room there. I know some older translations of the Bible refer to it as your closet, go into there and pray. And it reminded me after I heard that, that I know because I know how distracted I can be, a few years ago, how many of you remember that movie that was out a few years ago, War Room? Um, Yeah, and in that movie, it was a Christian movie that came out, and there was an, an older lady who had turned her closet into her prayer room. She called it her war room, I think, you know, and so... Uh, And I thought to myself, you know what, that sounds like such a good idea. And I felt stirred because I have a closet, uh, I had a closet in my bedroom, not a walk-in closet, just a step-in closet really. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should just find somewhere else for my clothes and I should turn this room into a prayer closet, into a prayer room. Yeah, great. I didn't though. I decided to turn it into a bathroom instead. So, uh, credit to Q Ackerman for helping me with that, Q Senior. But anyway, I can't remember what the thought process was, but I turned it into a bathroom, even though it's a tiny room, but it's all right, I'm a tiny person, so I don't need that much room, but it's just this little bathroom that I can go in. But anyway, I remembered that this week after John's teaching, and I thought, I should do something about that teaching. I've got to uh, find a place. And I thought, well, actually, why couldn't that be the place? So, this week, I have been going into that bathroom, not for the reasons that I would normally be going into the bathroom. Well, I've been going there for those reasons as well. But in the morning, I'll go in there. And in the scripture, I love where it says, go into your room and shut the door. There's something about that phrase, shut the door. Now, whenever I've prayed in any room, I usually shut the door. But there's something about going into a very small room and then shutting the door and just facing the door because there's not much else to face, really. (laughs) And it has been great for me this week. And I just want to encourage you. It's ironic in a way, isn't it? Because my closet became my bathroom, which has now become my closet, my prayer closet again. But uh, just finding a place where you can just go and shut the door and not be distracted and spend time with the Lord. Anyway, that's not what I want to talk about this morning, though, but I wanted to give, because it's good to think, you know, when we're hearing teachings on things, it's always good to be asking ourselves, what can I do in response to this? How, how can I actually do something? And uh, sometimes the person who's speaking will give specific things that we can do, but sometimes they don't, and we just have to find them, okay, what can I do? I want to be not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of it as well. Anyway, I actually want to talk to you this morning about the Holy Spirit. In fact, Mark Moore talked about the Holy Spirit the week before last. But I want to talk particularly about an aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit, which is so critical for us, empowering us to be witnesses. For quite a while now, I've had this phrase from Scripture in my mind that many of you will be familiar with from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So, talk more about that in a moment. Let's pray. Lord, we do uh, ask you uh, to speak to us, uh, to continue to speak to us. Thank you that we gather together, Lord, week by week, corporately you speak to us. And thank you that when we make the time to incline our ear to you, uh, 
in a small room, wherever we may be, you will speak to us as well. And you're going to do that this morning. Again, you'll continue to do it. So we do. We incline our ear to you now, Lord. We open our hearts to you. We know that you have things to say to each and every one. You have things for us to do, uh, ways for us to be, Lord, that will uh, be good for us and will bring glory to you. So we ask all of that, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Really, thinking about this phrase, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. It is that witnesses part of it that's been on my mind particularly. How many here were at the OCM conference that we went to this summer? Yeah, you know that there was a big emphasis in the teaching that came there on the call to mission that we have and uh, on evangelism. And I felt very stirred during that time. I know that many people did. But it's just so easy, isn't it, to forget. And I've wanted to not forget. I keep wanting to remember, you know, I have been called by God. I am someone who, by the grace of God, have been drawn into his mission in the earth. And I want to be his witness as well. And I think at this time of year as well, maybe I'm thinking particularly as we come into this new season, it is a time, isn't it, when we get into September, you kind of think about, re-engaging in a new way, don't you? You know, the summer's been, whatever it's been, for so many of us, it's different in terms of our schedules or the whole feel of things. But you get into September and it's kind of like, okay, here we go. We're re-engaging. Something I think that's just sort of ingrained into us from those years when we were at school and every year you went back to school in September and you had to re-engage. But not just re-engage where you were at, re-engage a step up, as it were, because you were always going into a new grade. There was always a sense of progression, a sense of new challenge ahead of you, that you were going to be stretched in a new way. And I usually feel that way whenever I come to September anyway, even though it's a long time since I've been in school, obviously. But I think that's a good thing. I think for all of us, we should be encouraged to think, okay, in this season, how am I stepping up now? How will I re-engage in a fresh way? And one of the things that we can do, I believe, is give real thought to how we outwork this call, this commission we have to be witnesses. So I want to read to you that verse in its context. So from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, we see there the following. In the first book, O Theophilus, pausing for a moment, so as many of you know, it's generally agreed that the book of Acts is written by Luke. And St. Luke, who wrote Luke's Gospel, and so that would be the first book that he was writing to Theophilus here. I uh, won't even go into trying to say who people think Theophilus is, but you could look it up if you want to. But anyway, so this is now Luke's second uh, writing to him. But he's saying, in the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John, John the Baptist, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, just think about it as the disciples are here with Jesus in this. What, how amazing it must have been for them. What an incredible time to be in this situation with Jesus. You know, bearing in mind that they had given themselves wholeheartedly to following Jesus, believing that he was the Messiah, he was the promised one who would come and change everything. But then how shocked, how devastated they must have been when it all seemed to fall apart, when Jesus gets arrested and he's executed. Wait, what? How, how disappointing for them all in all of that. But then 
Jesus is raised from the dead. And there they are with the risen Lord Jesus. I mean, ah, that is incredible. Just think about it. And also that they are with him for 40 days. Again, I've made this point. I think I'll make this point every time I come across this, but I can't get over it. The, the risen Lord Jesus was interacting with his disciples for 40 days. I, keep, I always, in my mind, even though I should know better, I do know better, but I always think of it in terms of Jesus being raised from the dead and going, oh, you know, here I am. I am raised from the dead. See ya. And off he goes. But they say, we saw him. He was raised from the dead. No, it wasn't like that at all. He was raised from the dead and then interacting with them for 40 days. What an incredible experience that must have been for them. And how pumped up they must have been. Thinking, yes, oh my goodness. We were kind of really confused. Didn't know what was going on before. But because you died. and now, But now you're alive. And so, whoa, you conquered death. Nothing is going to stop you. This is incredible. No wonder they're saying to him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because you know, we thought you were going to do it last time, but you didn't do it. And that was really weird. But anyway, here you are now risen from the dead. So will you at this time restore the kingdom? This is the time, right, where we're going to whoop the Romans and suddenly we're going to be top again. The kingdom of Israel is just going to be amazing. Just like in the days of David, King David, but better is that what you're going to do? It's not surprising that they would be asking that. But Jesus responds and says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but here's what it is for you to know, that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. You know, they wanted external change. They wanted things to change around them. That's how they wanted to see the kingdom come. But Jesus was promising internal change. He was saying, oh, I'm bringing change, okay. It's going to be change in you. And yes, actually, my kingdom is going to be established. But it's going to be established through this. Not in the external way you're looking for. And as I was thinking about that again, it's so like us, isn't it? We're so often reaching to God for our circumstances to change. But God is so often saying, I want to change you in the circumstances. I want to give you power by my Holy Spirit to change you in these circumstances. Now, it may well be that change in the circumstances is in store in due course. But first of all, let's start right there with you. God's kingdom is established through us when it's established in us. And it's established in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. He's calling us to be witnesses to his power. And that is what is going to see his kingdom established. So as I've thought about that, the first thing I was thinking about, because it was this word witness that stood out to me, you will be my witnesses. I want to think, what does it mean to be a witness? Well, of course, general understanding, we'd all have an idea what we mean by a witness, don't we? A witness is someone who has seen something. You might say that somebody has been, for example, a witness to an accident or a witness to a crime. There's somebody who's seen something. Uh, Legally speaking, a witness is someone who will bring testimony in court regarding what they've seen or what they know. As most of you probably will know, I used to be a lawyer before I came out here. And I was used to dealing with witnesses in the courtroom or dealing with witnesses in preparation for them being in the courtroom. And when you're looking for a witness, you need to be able to have somebody who uh, knows what they're talking about. People who have seen things, people who have experienced things, usually pertaining to the circumstances of the case directly because they were involved in the circumstances of the case. But sometimes I would call expert witnesses. So they were people who had not been directly involved in the circumstances of this case, but they were experts in a field and therefore could uh, speak to something that was important for the winning of the case. So I might call somebody as a witness who had a scientific background or had a medical background 
or had an industrial background or something like that, somebody who I could call and say, okay, these are the facts that are being argued. What can you say from your experience regarding the different arguments that are being brought here? So whether it's somebody who was uh, witnessed by virtue of the fact that they were directly involved in the circumstances or a witness by virtue of the fact that they were an expert in a field that related to the circumstances, they were people who had experience. They were people who could actually testify in that regard. Now, the Greek word that's being used in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that's translated in our Bibles as witness, is the Greek word martis or martus. And uh, it's the word from which we get our English word martyr, actually. And of course, when we think of the word martyr, we think of somebody who's actually died uh, for their faith. But that is not actually the root meaning of the word. The root meaning of the word is somebody who remembers, somebody who has knowledge or information about something that they can bring back to remembrance and that they can actually convey as well. They can give that information. They can bring something to light because of their knowledge or their information or their experience. They can confirm something. So it's witness in that sense, which ties in with what I've just said already. Also, though, the word means somebody who uh, can bear testimony to something even by their very lives. It's not even just about what they would say, but their lives prove something. We see the word being used that way in Scripture. So people whose lives bear testimony to the power of God or the faithfulness of God. In fact, although I don't have the Scripture to throw up there, many of you will be familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1, where it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, bear in mind, this is following Hebrews 11, where we see you recounted so many heroes of the faith and how they, they were examples to us of the faith. It's referring to them and saying in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I really only wanted to read that out for verse one, but it's so good, how can you stop? But since we have such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I think often we will hear that and because we think of the word witnesses and we think, oh, okay, so they're witnessing us. We think that they're looking at us kind of like, how are they going to do? How are they going to do? It's not meaning in that sense. It's meaning since we have such a great cloud of those who themselves have been witnesses to the power of God, as we heard in chapter 11, you know, Hebrews chapter 11, they have borne witness to the power of God. They have been witnesses. And since they are surrounding us, as it were, let's be inspired and provoked by them to throw off anything that would hold us back and to run with endurance the race set forth for us. So that's another meaning of the word witness. Those whose very lives, the way they've lived or the way they live and give testimony to Jesus is a witness. And then just to say, by extension to all of that, it is often used thinking of those who have given their lives, their witness, they've stood for Christ, their faithfulness to Christ has been even to the point of giving up their lives. So for example, in Acts chapter 22, verse 20, Stephen is referred to as a witness, and that's where it's referring to his death. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, Antipas referred to in the same way. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, the saints. But I just want to say, in all of those cases, um, even though it is connecting them, it's talking about the fact that they gave their lives, it's the fact that they're referred to as witnesses. They're not witnesses. They're not martyrs in the Greek sense of the word because they gave their lives. They gave their lives because they were witnesses, because they'd been so caught by what they had seen and experienced, that they would give their lives for it. Anyway, so that's kind of like unpacking the word. But coming back to the disciples, it's interesting that Jesus would say to them, you will be my witnesses. Because if we were just to think of the word witness in the sense of what people have seen, 
they'd already been witnesses, hadn't they? They'd seen so much already. In fact, later on in the book of Acts, we see them describing themselves or referring to themselves as witnesses in different ways, but all in relation to what they had already seen before this point at which Jesus is speaking to them. In Acts chapter 2, and in Acts chapter 3, and in Acts chapter 5, um, we, they refer to themselves as witnesses of the fact that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Yes, they had seen that. They actually saw it. In Acts chapter 10, verse 39, they describe themselves as being witnesses of all that Jesus did, including, they say, uh, that he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. They saw it with their own eyes. They saw his earthly ministry. In Acts chapter 13, verse 31, they refer to themselves as witnesses of his post-resurrection experiences, such as uh, appearances rather, such as the very one that we're seeing in Acts chapter 1 there. So these were all times when they had already witnessed things, but Jesus was saying to them, you will actually be my witnesses in the future. Because there's a difference between having witnessed something and then being a witness of the thing that you have already witnessed. <laughs> Do you get what I say? It's one thing to have seen it, but will you actually testify to it in due course? And so what Jesus is saying is you are going to testify to what you've experienced, what you know of me when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and enabled you to do it. Because the thing is, we need an enabling, don't we? Jesus knows we need an enabling. Truth of the matter is, most of us in this room have experienced Jesus. We've seen something of Jesus. We know Jesus. Most of us in this room, I think, would say, Jesus has completely changed my life. But do we say that Jesus has completely changed my life? By what? Which I mean, do we ever bear witness to it to other people? How often are we talking to other people about the fact that Jesus has changed our lives? I venture to suggest for most people, it's not that often that we're talking to other people. Why is that? Maybe because we don't feel that we have the power to do it. So now I want to talk a little bit about that word power. The word power here, again, some of you will know this already, but it's translating a Greek word, uh, dynamis or dunamis. It's the word from which we get English words like dynamic or dynamite. But even though dynamite is an explosive thing, actually, the root meaning of this word, it just means to be able to do something or to be capable of doing something. It means ability. You know, you will receive ability when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive capability. It talks about inherent power or the power to actually achieve something, to actually do something. You will receive ability. Because I think oftentimes when we root our thinking into a big sense of the word power, you know, we're like, something's going to happen to me, like some sort of crazy superhero experience where suddenly I'm like, look at these guns suddenly popping out. And no, I was like, sorry, yeah, I should <laughs> put them away again. Um, no, um, but it's like you will receive ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It even means in the sense of the, you will receive the will to do something. Because, you know, that's the problem a lot of the time, isn't it? You're like, oh, I can't even bring myself to do it. I just have the will. You will receive, it's a spirit of strength as opposed to a spirit of cowardice, or as opposed to a spirit of reluctance. This is the sense to it, which I feel is so much more accessible in a way, because, again, you can have witnessed something, but still not, for some reason or other, be a witness. Or even in, naturally speaking, we see that's the case often, don't we? Like, you know, you can hear the police put out appeals and say, we're calling for any witnesses to come forward in relation to this incident. And they have to call for witnesses to come forward because oftentimes we know people saw this, but we don't know who those people are. And we, we need those people to come forward and to bear witness to what they've witnessed. And oftentimes it's a struggle. People don't come forward. Why is it that people don't come forward even in those circumstances? I think there can be a lot of reasons. Um, 
Sometimes it's just because we don't even think to. I know, you know, I've been in situations, maybe you have as well, where I've been driving along and I see something. Maybe I, I see, a, unfortunately, an accident or something. I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. I saw incredible what I just saw there. But I'm driving on, it never crosses my mind. Well, maybe I should stop because not only I could help someone in this situation, perhaps, but maybe I could bring some information, some objective information it would help because I actually saw what happened. I saw that it was him that went through the light. I saw it. But oftentimes we don't even think to. We might think, oh, as soon as I see one of my friends, I'm going to tell them what I just saw. Amazing. Well, that's great to tell your friends. But what about telling people you know, where it would actually help? But sometimes we just don't think about doing it. Or sometimes we do think about it, but we think, oh, I don't want to get involved. <laughs> no. No. I mean, that's... I just don't want to get involved. Often we just don't want to get involved, do we? That can be a problem. Sometimes we feel like I would be too scared. What if then I had to go to court? I wouldn't want to go to court to do that. No. I mean, I understand that. It's a scary thing going to court. I would understand that even in my role as a lawyer. We're dealing with witnesses all the time. Um, oftentimes, a big role of mine was to reassure witnesses, to talk them through. What it would be like, I know this is a big deal. You know, you've never been in a courtroom before. You've never had to stand up there. You've never had to go on oath. You know that a lot is relying on this. Okay, let me just talk you through. It's okay about how you handle this situation. You need to be reassured in this situation because it's a scary prospect to do it. I was uh, telling you in the earlier meeting as well, I remembered one particular incident where I had a case and I had somebody who was going to be a witness uh, on behalf of... Uh, my client, and he was a, an older gentleman. He was in his, well, older, actually, no. I was just say he was an older gentleman in his 50s, which is now actually younger than I am. But anyway, um, but he seemed like an older gentleman to me at the time. And he was a pretty respectable businessman, and he had really good information that would help my case. But he was super nervous about the idea of giving evidence in court. He'd never done that before. I was trying to talk him through it, trying to reassure him. Anyway, we had the court case. Uh, it was running in the morning. We got to lunchtime, took a break for lunch, and he was going to be on giving evidence first thing in the afternoon. Well, he was so nervous that he decided that over the lunchtime he would go out to the local pub to have a couple of drinks just to, you know, give himself a bit of courage. Well, he sort of overdid it, really. And uh, by the time he came back, he was raring to go. He was like, he had his confidence, that's for sure. And he started like, you know, even with the other side's lawyer, just going at it about stuff, getting out of hand in the things he was saying. I was like, help, this should have been so good. It should have been so good. It's so bad right now. Just because this guy had been so nervous that he was trying to find his courage in the wrong place. But it's understandable to be scared about being a witness. Sometimes people don't want to be witnesses because when they think about it, think, well, I know what I think I saw, but maybe I'm not so sure now. I mean, I, I think this is what happened, but I could be wrong. So therefore, I don't know, necessarily want to say something if I'm wrong, I'm going to mess it up. That's why people can be reluctant. And the thing is, I feel it can often be the case, so many of these things can be the same with us bearing witness to Jesus. I mean, we know that we could bear witness to Jesus. We maybe know that we should bear witness to Jesus, but so often we don't bear witness to Jesus. Why? Well, sometimes we don't even think to. Again, we can see something or experience something, something again, and we'll be like, whoa, that was amazing. And then we just go off and don't think to say anything to anybody about it, except maybe our friend who already knows how great Jesus is. What about bearing witness to somebody who doesn't know in a situation where it could make a real difference? Or we don't want the inconvenience of starting to talk about Jesus in this situation because we're not sure what the consequences of doing that would be. Or oh, this could, I don't know, this could be awkward. It could be embarrassing. I don't know whether I want to get into this. Or we feel too scared, basically. Just think, I, I just don't... I don't feel I have it in me to do that. Or maybe it's because all of a sudden we don't feel so certain about what we believe. I, I mean, I know what I've seen and experienced, but, but ah, 
I'm not sure that I feel confident enough to be able to talk to somebody else about that. What if I mess it up? But what I will say is, Jesus never expected that any of us would be able to do this in our own ability. So all of these things are completely understandable. Jesus understands them. That's why he wants to give us the ability by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. Truth is, even if none of those factors apply to you, if you're like, I'm a super confident person. Yeah, I like getting involved in stuff like that. I like getting involved in other people's business. You know, I, I'm, yeah, I like any opportunity I can have to talk to anybody. That's great. Maybe that might not be so good anyway, if that's in your own power, if that's in your own ability, your own strength, your own personality, your own inclinations. It's his power that he wants to give us in order that we will be witnesses. In fact, Jesus himself said, John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, said, when the helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. So he's saying, you'll bear witness. Yes, you've seen all these things we're talking about. But more importantly, you will have the Holy Spirit who is himself the ultimate witness to me. So therefore, you'll be able to be witnesses for me because you will have the Holy Spirit. So how can we look to the Holy Spirit for power to be his witnesses? Well, I believe we can look to him for power to be witnesses in our lives, in the way we live, also in our words and the things we say, and in our works, the things we do. So um, just in the remaining time, I just want to talk about those three areas. Bearing witness to Jesus by the whole power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our words, and in our works. First of all, in our lives. So from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, we see there it says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable. Uh, in the NIV, in the International Version, it says, live such good lives among the Gentiles, amongst unbelievers. In uh, the NASB, it says, keep your behaviour excellent. Wow. Just saying, this is the first way that we bear witness to Jesus, that we live excellent, honourable, good lives. Now, again, we may feel in and of ourselves, whoa, excellent. That's pretty high standard. You know, I, I'm not perfect. Well, no, you're not. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can lead this life. We can lead lives like this. You know, by the Holy Spirit, we can know God's rule in us. When Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the rule of God. And the rule of God starts, first of all, in us. Again, like I said before, the kingdom is established through us when it's established in us. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, uh, we read there, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. So it's not like just going through the motions with what, you know, the rules of what you should or shouldn't do, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We need to see God's rule out in us and outworked through us in righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, righteousness, therefore, we choose to live right and are enabled by the Holy Spirit to choose to live right. And so even though it's not like we're dogmatically following rules or legalistically following rules, we actually choose to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing in situations because of the Holy Spirit. We have peace by the Holy Spirit, a peace that goes beyond understanding. In circumstances where everybody would, no one else would be at peace naturally, and we wouldn't be at peace naturally, we can know a supernatural peace from the Holy Spirit, which will bear witness to the fact that we belong to Jesus, that Jesus is actually real in our lives. And joy as well. We can be people of joy all the time. Even no matter what the circumstances, not happiness, you know, often as people have said, happiness depends on what is happening. It's circumstantial. But we can have a joy which isn't dependent on what is happening. It's from the Holy Spirit. And we can have that joy at all times by the Holy Spirit. That's evidence of the kingdom of God. That's evidence of Jesus in us. 
I know for myself, I've seen over the years, thank the Lord, I've seen an increase of the evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I think I got them all, did I? Nine. Anyway, um, you can come and tell me afterwards if I miss for now. But uh, thankfully, I see evidence of these increasing in my life. And so I should, so we should. We're Christians. We have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's not just that we're generally nice people. It's that we have the Holy Spirit, we can access the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit to change. We should all be changing year on, year on. Again, think about coming into the new year. We should all look back and go, actually, I see more evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life now than I did last year. I'm more like Jesus than I was this time last year. Second Corinthians chapter 3, one of my favorite verses, I don't have it up there, but uh, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. All of us should be able to look at our lives and say, I am being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Yes, there's a long way to go. Duh. Obviously there is. But I'm not the same as I was last year. You know, we should all be able to say that this is available to us. I said in the last meeting, I have this goal. I want to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. I at the very least, I want to be the best person I know. Now, I don't say that in a weird way, but I just think I want to excel in all of these things. I want to be more and more Jesus-like because I want to bear witness to the reality of Jesus in my life, that Jesus really does change lives. You know, we can do that. You know, we talk to people, Jesus saves you, Jesus changes lives. Okay, how has he changed yours? Um, we should all be able to say, and it's an ongoing thing, not just the, uh, I used to be a drug dealing murderer and now I'm not. No, I mean, it's just like in every way he's changing our lives. I used to be an impatient person and I'm way less impatient than I used to be. You know, I used to be, whatever it may be, but I'm more now this. This is the change uh, I read one somewhere, it's always stood in my mind this phrase, Christians should live lives that demand an explanation. The people should look at our lives and go, what is it about you? Why, why are you the way you, in a good way, <laughs> you know, why are you the way you are? How do you not respond like other people respond? And just like, you know what, <laughs> I totally, everything within me would respond in that way, except that I thank God that, gee, I'm a Christian and Jesus is helping me to change. I see myself changing. I read, um, I don't know how many people have heard, it seemed to me that in the last meeting, not many people had heard of Dr. Livingston, the famous encounter between uh, Henry Stanley and Dr. Livingston, where Dr. Livingston, uh, David Livingston, I think his name was, uh, he was a Christian missionary and explorer in Central Africa. Um, and um, he was gone for so long, people didn't even know where they were. And so Henry Stanley, who was uh, also an explorer, but a journalist as well, he was sent to try to find Dr. Livingston and eventually found him in the middle of the jungle in Central Africa. Apparently, he's quoted as saying that apparently he said, Dr. Livingston, I presume, you know, it's a nice kind of very formal way of uh, meeting somebody in the jungle. I mean, yeah, duh, it's obviously going to be Dr. Livingston. Who else would it be in the middle of the jungle here, you know? But uh, obviously, Dr. Livingston was a Christian. He was a missionary, apparently a very godly man. And Henry Stanley was not a Christian, but apparently, I read here, I'll just quote it to you. It says, when Stanley had discovered Livingston in Central Africa and had spent some time with him, he said... If I had been with him any longer, I would have been compelled to be a Christian. That was just the testimony of his life. It, it just like, I would have been compelled to be a Christian if I'd stayed any longer. He goes on to say, and he, Dr. Livingston, never spoke to me about it at all. Well, first thought from that is like, okay, so his, the testimony of his life was so powerful that you almost felt compelled to be a Christian, even without him saying anything to you, just because of the testimony of his life. But the second thing I have is, why did Dr. Livingston not say anything to him at all? That's so weird to me. In fact, maybe if Dr. Livingston had said something to him, he would have become a Christian. I think this is a problem as well. Sometimes we can have a focus, which is on, I just want to live a godly life. I just want to be a testimony to Jesus by the way I live. 
but you're never telling anybody that you're living this way because of Jesus. So you're leaving people to conclude that you are just naturally a nice person. Because people don't know any other reason. They'll just think, oh, he's amazing. He's just the nicest person I know. He's so incredible. And they'll give you all the credit for it. Because you're not telling them that Jesus gets all the credit for it. So we have to be people who not just, we testify with our lives, but we also have to testify with our words. Which brings me to my next point. So we testify with our words as well. You know, even Jesus relies on the Holy Spirit and is speaking. Just in that passage that we read, it said, um, after Jesus had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. That's interesting, isn't it? That Jesus was speaking to them through the Holy Spirit. We see as well, I don't have it to put up there, but in Luke chapter 4, Uh, We see Jesus famously saying, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. You know, Jesus said, yeah, I'm anointed by the spirit of God myself. So for us, we want to be anointed to speak. In um, Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, it says, when they deliver you over on the assumption that you are going to, as Christians, be delivered over to the authorities because you are Christians, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So the Holy Spirit bears, enables us to bear witness to Jesus with our words as well. You know, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if our hearts are filled with the Holy Spirit, then actually there's going to be witness to Jesus that's coming out. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, we see that not only does the Holy Spirit help, will the Holy Spirit help us with what to say, but also how to say it even. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit coming through in us, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Um, Again, even with good behavior, even with excellent lives, people will still speak against us as Christians. You know, people will love the fact that you're a good person until you tell them that you're a good person because of Jesus. Then they won't like it necessarily. Or one of those Christians, you know, they'll want to slander you at that point. Some people will anyway. But again, we, we match our words with our behavior in these circumstances. And in both cases, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. I just want to say, you know, the Holy Spirit enables me to speak in situations, coming back to this whole idea of reluctance, where I don't want to speak. You know, I, I'm not a super introverted person or anything, but there are many situations where I kind of feel like, oh, I should engage this person in conversation, sometimes even just engaging somebody in conversation, not even necessarily sharing the gospel with them. But uh, sometimes I don't want to speak and I know I should. I had a situation happen not long ago where, well, just to backtrack for a minute, about a year ago, I met somebody just in passing. I was literally just introduced to this person. Nothing more passed between us in terms of conversation. But I felt in my heart something to pray for this person. I put them on my prayer list And ever since then, from time to time, I've prayed for this person, honestly, never knowing whether I would ever see them again, and never knowing whether I would meet them. And then just recently, I was uh, at an event, and this person came and sat down right next to me. I'm like, (laughs) they didn't come and sit down next to me because of me. They came to sit next to somebody who was near me, but they happened, therefore, to sit next to me. And I'm like oh my, this is the person, I've been praying for this person and I never thought I would even necessarily see them again. I should engage them in conversation. But there was something, I don't know, it was like a deer in the headlight type moment where I think, I don't know what to say. They started talking to the other person and then, you know, time went by and there were times of complete silence. I have to think, I don't even know whether they would remember me. This is going to be really weird. If I t- we only met just in passing. So why would I even say anything? Well, I would say something because I felt to put them on my prayers to be praying for them and now God's brought them right next to me again so I should say something to them. I don't want to say something. And then the longer time goes by, the more awkward it gets. 
We've been sitting next to each other for over half an hour now, and I haven't said anything to them. And I'm thinking to myself, it's too late now to say anything. It would be really weird to engage in conversation with this person. How do I even engage in the conversation with them? What can I even say? I kept thinking of different ways that I could open up a conversation, and they were all dumb. No, no, that's a dumb thing to say. No, that's a dumb and awkward thing to say. And I was like, help me, God, this is so, I really want to be able just to engage with this person. I don't want to walk away from you having failed in this. And in the end, I just thought, you know what? If I can't think of anything to say other than something dumb, I'm going to say something dumb. You know, so I just said one of these dumb opening type things. You like this sort of event then, do you? Well, they're there, aren't they? So presumably they do. But anyway, that's... Well, I said, and it got into a conversation. And even in saying all this, guys, I'm not saying that led to a presentation of the gospel resulting in them falling on their knees, giving their lives to the Lord. It wasn't even kind of like a hugely substantive conversation. But I had a conversation with them, which I didn't feel in myself I was able to even start, but because I wanted to, and I asked the Holy Spirit for help. In the end, he gave me an ability which, honestly, I didn't feel that I had. It's just something even as simple as that. That's where it starts because, you know, pre preaching the gospel to people will start with engaging people. We have to be able to do that. And if we don't feel able to do it, that's fine because Jesus will give us an ability by the Holy Spirit to do that. All right, finally, quickly. Uh, so in our lives, in our words, and in our works, you know, and we pray, don't we, in the Lord, for your kingdom come, your will be done. If we're talking about the coming of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God comes when his will is done. And so we want to be people who give ourselves to doing his will. Uh, we want to be a people who are about the good things that he wants us to do. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus says, You're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Restored. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So people are to see our good works. They're to see our lives. They're to hear our words, and they're to see our good works as well. This is that they might give glory to God. And also, uh, not just works done in our own strength either, but obviously not, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. That should be good consolation for all of us, okay? So even Paul wasn't using lofty speech or wisdom. That's good because I don't have lofty speech or wisdom. So I should be okay then. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Yes, anybody identify? And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So yes, we're looking to do the work of God, but we're believing not just that we'll do nice things, but we're asking God, somehow work through this, God, to demonstrate something of who you are. I just want to say as well, one thing I found so helpful in talking to people about the Lord is at the end of it just offering to pray for them, which again takes courage. But, you know, sometimes just say, hey, just after all, even if they have actually been arguing against me, um, even just to be able to say, hey, listen, all right, we're finished now. By the grace of God, hopefully, even though they were arguing, I didn't respond, I didn't react in a worldly way, you know, through the Holy Spirit, hopefully coming through me, so that we can close the conversation and it'd be good. But I say, can I just actually pray for you? Because you do want to know the truth, don't you? And people will say, yes, of course I want to know the truth. Okay, can I just pray for you then? Just so that you will know the truth. I know that you don't believe that what I'm saying is the truth. But so can I pray with you so that you will know the truth? And, you know, oftentimes people say, sure, whatever. You know, so I'll just lay my hand on them, you know, and I'll pray and just say, Lord God, I thank you for this person. I will thank God sincerely for them. You know, and if anything in particular that I can thank God for about them, I will. 
And uh, I'll just ask God to reveal himself to them. Seriously, so often when I've done that with people, you can see them tangibly affected by the power of God. Even though they don't believe what I have to say, there's something about praying in faith for people. Now, I'm not saying that will always happen or you'll always see evidence of it, but I times have seen evidence of it as well. Somebody tangibly shaken as I'm praying for them, and they don't even know what's going on either. But it's bearing witness to Jesus by the power of the Spirit through something that we do. So in all of this, I just want to encourage you. Jesus said to those disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Obviously, he was referring to what would happen on the day of Pentecost. Uh, So many of us here are Christians who have known what it is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But we also know that we are to be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, 18 says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, but basically means really be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fact that it's command to us shows that it's something that we're meant to do something about it. We're meant to be intentional about asking to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So every time we don't feel we have the ability I don't have the ability to live the way I know I'm meant to in order to witness to Jesus. Or we don't have the ability to speak. I don't feel I have the ability to say the words. Or we don't feel we have the ability to do the things that we know we've been called to do. We should always be reaching to the Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. I want the power, the ability to be a witness for Jesus through my life, through my words, through my works. And Jesus will do it. Let's be a people as we come into the season who commit ourselves to being witnesses, for them, to growing as witnesses. I mean, again, we'll grow in it in steps, but let's be committed to taking steps towards being the witnesses that he's called us to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. So yes, Lord, I ask that for myself. I ask it for each one of us coming into this season. We, we know we've been called to be ambassadors of yours, Lord God. We've been called to be proclaimers of your good news, Lord God. We've called to be witnesses. We've been called to be witnesses. Thank you for that high calling and thank you for the amazing power that you have made available to us by your Holy Spirit. May we be a people who live and walk in that power to your glory. Jesus, we ask it in your precious name. Amen.